My name is MJ Shao. I'm the director of solar research at GTM Research. And this morning, I want to break down PV systems and take a look at you know, what's, what's in store for PV system technologies and costs in the US. So for those of you that were here yesterday and saw Shale's presentation, you know, it was a very exciting time to be in the industry. And, we might, and by 2020, we expect just in the residential sector for over 30 states to open up to, you, to solar energy. Uh, but the question, of course, is how do we get there? And of course, inst installation costs and technology are going to play a big role in opening up the market. But first, let's take a step back and look how far we've come as an industry and really appreciate that. In the past three years, uh, we've installed, just in the past three years alone, we've installed over 13 gigawatts of solar energy. At the end of this year, we're going to have installed six and a half gigawatts of solar energy just in this year, which is more than three times the size of, the, of what we were installing just three years ago. And of course, no surprises, the fall in module costs drove a lot of that uh, ability to install more solar power. In fact, on the residential systems, more than 40% of the cost reductions that we've seen in the past few years have come because of the fall in module prices alone. Now, I always think this, it's really important to put that in context, because when I started in the industry in 2006, we, couldn't, we could buy modules for close to $4 a watt, and today we can install a residential system for that price. Similarly, just five years ago, what it would cost for modules alone, we can install commercial flat roof systems. And what's incredible to me is just a few years ago, what it took to buy modules, we can install utility systems and have them operate out in the field. And the, and the, those costs continue to improve. Now, one, of course, what that means is we also need to temper our expectations for how much further uh, costs can come down for the industry, right? So in the past three years, we've seen costs come down for residential commercial utility uh, systems by anywhere between 33 to 50%. Uh, in the next few years, we don't have you know, it would be great for residential system costs to fall another 40% in the next three years. But I think it's a little uh, aggressive to assume that. So really what we're looking at is closer to 20 to 25% system cost reductions in the various market segments. Now before we go on, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page and we're talking about the same thing here. So first of all, when we're talking about installation costs here, we're talking about turnkey costs to install the PV system not talking about fair market valuation. And we're also just talking about the PV system itself. So nothing like interconnection upgrades, grid upgrades in order to support that system. When we talk about hardware costs for modules, inverters, balance of systems for the PV system, we're talking about factory gain and wholesale prices, not uh, what you would buy from perhaps a distributor. And when we talk about distribution, we usually assign that to uh, in a, as a markup in the soft cost categories. And Another note is that costs, of course, are going to be dependent on the competitive environment. So, of course, if there's a ton of people uh, looking to install solar, of course, that is, uh, that's going to push costs down. Uh, if, you're, if the price of electricity or the avoided cost of, uh, that you're going up against, that's, of course, going to push costs down as well. So there is a competitive dynamic that we have to keep in mind. And of course, every single project has individual characteristics. Uh, these are average prices. There are definitely going to be significantly higher prices, sometimes significantly lower prices than what we're showing here today. So, but with that in mind, if we look at, you know, even with the best in class US residential installers can, can build solar for today, and we're looking about what we see in the next three years as a 20% reduction in system costs. So about 60 cents a watt, 60 to 70 cents a watt in terms of reduction to this, this when till after the ITC drops down. Now, I would love nothing better than to walk through every single cost component here, residential through utility, and describe why we view uh, why these system prices and why we view these cost components are going to come down. What is our view on that on technology as well as the, the you know, impact of other uh, 
the impact of other factors in that. But I won't be able to do that because, first of all, I think I would bore a lot of you when we're talking about commodity markets of like structure prices. Um, and you know, whoever decided to organize this conference only gave me actually 20 minutes, in fact. So you know, it was a very difficult selection process in terms of figuring out what was going to make the cut into this, this um, presentation. And, and so we, I used a lot of like inscrutable selection techniques and decided on four things to focus on. So first, uh, decentralization and the trend towards distributed optimization, which is part of a, a bigger trend towards the impact of technology on labor and different logistics costs, which that is also part of this dri bigger drive towards targeting the speed of installation as well as looking towards operational efficiency. And so those were the obvious ones. And then the, for the fourth and final slot, it was a very difficult decision because there are a lot of different uh, good topics to reach out to. But you know, looking, you know, this is a topic that I may not have picked earlier in the year to talk about, but based on the recent discussions that we've had about market design, about you know, energy storage and how it's going to affect PV, I really think we need to start thinking about future-proofing our PV systems and the modernization of the grid. And of course, that leaves a couple of good topics that I won't be able to get to, including looking at soft cost pa reduction pathways, as well as the impact of safety on technology. But really, you, know, you should blame the format of the session and not really the, the topics themselves. So let's get into it and the drive towards decentralization. So, the age of module level power electronics is here. I remember a few years ago, people were saying, are microinverters DC optimizers going to take off? And the answer is quite simply, yes, they have. And now they are almost 60% or actually 55% of the US residential market in the first half alone of this year. And that is just starting to, to uh, come to steam as we see every single major residential inverter supplier in the US now has some form of module level power electronics design. Uh, and that's, you know, of course, we've seen ABB and SMA release theirs in the past years. And this year, we actually saw a couple of white label products between Fronius and Kako New Energy as well. But what I think is really exciting, too, is that we're starting to see it creep into the commercial landscape with some three-phase uh, products that is especially dual and quad mini inverters. And the really, really interesting to me, thing to me is starting to see module manufacturers get involved looking at true AC module solutions uh, through their own designs, not necessarily just partnering up with the module level power electronics vendors. Decentralization, distributed optimization doesn't necessarily just mean in the residential sector either. You know, three-phase string inverters have been introduced in Europe for the past few years. Uh, were rec more recently introduced in the US in just the past year and a half, two years. And it's one of these cases when you look at the upfront costs, you wonder, OK, well, a central inverter costs less than the three-phase string inverter. Why would anyone, else buy why would anyone ever buy a three-phase string inverter? But it turns out, when you stop comparing just component costs, you start looking at the differences between wiring and labor, uh, combiner boxes, new requirements for arc fault uh, combiner boxes. You know, what do you have to do to grade and, and build a concrete pad for the system? And suddenly, the picture looks a little bit different. And now, again, you have to look at how your technology choices impact total installation costs. And so the question now isn't whether you should use a three-phase string inverter or a commercial central inverter in a commercial system. It, the question is, to what size? You know, is it just going to be for 500 kW systems where this makes sense? Or what we're starting to see more and more of is one megawatt, two megawatt, five megawatt, even 20 megawatt systems moving to this architecture as the price of these different components start to come down as well. One thing to realize is that this is not limited to just power electronics. You know, I think in the past we could see uh, this slide and talk about three-phase string and central inverters, but it's also starting to happen in structural balance of systems too. You have now a big push towards trackers because of how quickly the tracker costs have come down. And now there's uh, a question of whether 
the incumbent technologies in which we're trying to drive as many kilowatts with a single motor, with a single actuator, is better than maybe just driving 20 to 30 kilowatts at a time. And look, leveraging similar discussions that we would on the power electronics side to save on overall balance of systems, as well as improve the reliability uh, and maintenance uh, characteristics of the system as well. You know, this is, again, this, this idea of looking at how technology affects other parts of the, of the system is, is, you know, part of this trend because of how hard the, the hardware vendors have been hit the past few years. It's not just the module manufacturers that have seen their margins and costs come down. You know, the structural balance of systems guys have seen it. The, the inverter guys have seen it. You know, people who are supplying, people who are building the projects have seen it as well. And so some of the, yes, some of the early cost reductions have been because of industry scale up. But, you know, we've also seen the, an immense simplification of the systems that are being developed uh, and just the drive towards the commodity cost itself. And so if we want to continue to bring, uh, if we want to continue to bring the cost of solar down, we have to start looking at not just, all right, how do we build a cheaper product necessarily, but how do we really make sure that we're leveraging that product so that it, again, lowers the cost of the system as in the context of the full installation. You know, one of the examples uh, I think about in the residential sector is a drive towards railless mounting structures. Now, railless, of course, uh, you get rid of an entire piece of, of the mounting structure on a residential system, uh, but there are some added, you know, integration, engineering costs that are likely involved, and so you, you sometimes get to a higher uh, product cost, at least right now in its initial infancy or, or, or little more smaller part of the market. Uh, but when you factor in the savings on labor, the fact that you're not cutting rails in the field, the fact that you save on logistics, the fact that um, you don't even have to install an entire component and you can go faster. You know, when you look at both the hardware itself and the labor, then you start to see a more compelling case. And remember, these, these technologies a lot of times are just in their infancy. And of course, everybody knows the, the big uh, manufacturers that are, uh, you know, with, with Zep Solar and recently acquired by Solar City. And as a result of that, that void that was created, we see a lot of new players coming in trying to provide products there as well. Uh, we'll see some of the incumbents, I'm sure, come into the market soon. And actually, I think there's going to be a lot of uh, good excitement in that space, as well as a lot of, you know, maybe not great excitement in the sense that there will be some consolidation, and I do expect that there will be some legal battles as people figure out who actually owns the IP and what they, can they defend as far as IP there. Similarly, in the, the utility space, I think what a lot of people have seen in the fixed tilt space is that, you know, the technology is pretty simple now. You're just using a bunch of steel, off-the-shelf steel components. They're engineered to, to do what you want them to do. Uh, really, the different vendors, they're trying to differentiate not on the product itself, but really on what they can offer as far as services, warranty. Sometimes they'll even do the installation for you as well. And the, again, we've gone past the scale-up part of the industry curve, right? So now you can't really drive that money, that much cost reduction as you continue to build bigger projects or continue to scale up your business. So, you know, the one thing you could say is, well, maybe fixed tilt systems are dead and, and maybe there's nothing left to do there. But I think that we should never discount the ability for our uh, industry to innovate around technology. And, you know, I don't necessarily have any answers as far as fixed tilt goes, but I've seen some interesting things. For example, folded steel or hollow frame fixed tilt uh, projects that, that look to ship flat steel, lowering logistics costs, lowering labor costs, bending them on site. You know, something that's being offered by a small company in Ohio called Industrial Origami, as well as it's something that First Solar does as well. Uh, there's also, uh, perhaps in the future, some movement towards automated installations, trying to get rid of labor costs within the system as well by using robots, essentially. Uh, and so where's the, where's the balance point? Does that actually work? You know, that's a great question. That's something our industry needs to be willing to explore and ask and see if this will work out for us. You know, one thing, um, and again, one thing that is, 
that this isn't just structural balance of systems too, right? It's, it's everything, power electronics. How do we look at our designs and influence labor and logistics in the system as well? So a thing that everyone's talking about now in the utility scale and maybe sometime in the future in the commercial scale is the movement from 1,000 volts to 1,500 volt on the DC side of the system. Um, you know, it seems like just yesterday we were talking about 600 to 1,000 and we're already on 1,000 to 1,500 volts. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of the, the DC side uh, cost mitigation, but one of the things I think is interesting is when you move to these bigger, uh, this higher DC voltage, you can build bigger inverters, and using those bigger inverters, you can build bigger block sizes in your plant, and suddenly you're saving, you're using, I mean, this is intuitive, right? You're, you have less land that you're trying to grade for the inverter, less skids that you're building, less logistics in order to coordinate the, the installation of those inverters. And suddenly, again, because of a simple technology design, technology choice, uh, you're able to save uh, on the back end of, of what it takes to install that system. You know, this is all, again, trying to get more out of, you know, what you've already paid for, what you're going to pay for in a system. And so when we look at costs in a system, right, Let's take a residential system, for example. Parts and labor are pretty, you know, they're, I think most people are around $2 a watt, maybe a little bit under $2 a watt, as far as all the hardware that involves getting uh, installed and, you know, again, the, the, the actual boots on the roof, so to speak. But then you have all these service-related fixed costs, design, engineering, permitting, you have custom acquisition costs, you have the margin, you have the overhead. A lot of those costs are fixed. And so if you can marginally increase the size of a system, either by adding more modules or more efficient modules or getting more energy harvest out of there, you're suddenly lowering all these fixed costs and you come to a lower dollar per watt figure. Some of the things that we're seeing in the commercial side is, is the takeoff of commercial carport systems for this exact reason. You've already done all the work developing the project uh, you know, looking at the credit risk of the off taker, you know, getting them to, to buy into solar, working with the financier, getting the tax equity involved. That's the stuff that's hard. That's the stuff that is, is costly. And then building modules, it's just a marginal cost, right? So now if you can build um, a much larger system, you can get some volume discounts. Uh, these systems now aren't, you know, twice the size, you know, for example, carpet systems are not no longer like twice the cost of, of, of rooftop systems, they're pretty competitive actually. And so you build a larger system, amortize those fixed, feet, fixed dollars over a bigger system and suddenly you have a more cost competitive system. And that's a very similar thing again in terms of squeezing the roof on an east-west system that we're seeing. So I don't have much time left so I do want to make sure that I spend a little bit of time on future-proofing PV system. And you know, if you think about it, almost 90% of the capacity that's been installed on the grid has come online in five years. That means, you know, most of these systems haven't even hit uh, their basic inverter warranty terms. They haven't hit their EPC warranty years. You know, we still, there's still a lot about the lifetime of a PV system that we don't understand, especially with all the new products that have been out in the field. And in the next few years, we're also going to see the number of PV uh, nearly triple by 2018 as far as what's being connected on the grid. So there's a big question of, you know, what does, for example, operations and maintenance and asset management look like? How do we, you know, what we're doing now, is that truly scalable to what it's going to be, you know, just five years down the line? The question is, you know, the, even just managing operations for, your company, you know, if you're installing even just a couple megawatts this year, are you ready to start installing 10 times that in just a few years as the market is growing and being able to do that efficiently and being competitive with that in light of the, the cost reductions that are, that are coming and that are um, incumbent. So, and also we're going to start as demand diffuses. If you want to have national aspirations, are you ready to deal with all the different local codes, the different rate structures, different costs of doing business associated with these different markets? 
That's a big question. And, and more so, you know, are we ready to, are our systems ready to adjust to that? And really, you know, what we're installing today, are they going to be able to take advantage of some of the things we were talking about yesterday in terms of rate redesign or new ways for uh, residential systems, commercial systems to get involved in wholesale markets? You know, so how do we actually implement things like the connected home? And I think, you know, this is where we start to think about things is not necessarily just costs need to come down, costs need to come down, but also what can we do with the existing hardware or the hardware that we're going to be building? And I like to think of it as, you know, the inverter uh, is a great platform for this. You know, right now, all we're doing is connecting a PV array to inverter, converts DC to AC, does some MPPT for us. But what about the future when we can start looking at weather and grid conditions and need to adjust that? What if there's a storage system involved, electric vehicles? What if there, you want to adjust so that it, it's looking and taking inputs from your, from your building energy management system? You know, so now, instead of just converting DC to AC, feeding electricity to the load or to the grid, we're talking about things like, when is it best to output energy to the grid versus uh, offset your own load? You know, depending on if, you know, for example, if net metering is gone. You know, this is a situation that they're dealing with Europe in terms of when does it make sense to take advantage of the feed-in tariff versus, you know, self-consuming the electricity. Doing some of the autonomous grid balancing functionality, volt var control, power factor, voltage right through, things of that nature. We're going to start to see more of that, especially, uh, for example, in Hawaii and California with Rule 21 uh, uh, looking to be approved as well. You know, we'll want to do, make sure that, that we're actually taking care of these systems, managing the loads, managing the plant, and what we can do as far as getting rid of the intermittency of renewable energy systems so we can start getting credit for it. Uh, we want to look at how do we, again, how do we bid into maybe ancillary services, different wholesale markets, uh, or, you know, aggregate a bunch of systems out in the different parts of the grid to play into those markets and get more value out of the system as well. Uh, is there a need for off-gridding, critical backup, things of that nature now that you are bringing storage into it? And finally, you know, doing, is there more intelligent things we can do in terms of looking again at the maintenance? So these are all the applications that we need to start thinking about instead of just, you know, maximum PowerPoint tracking to converting DC to AC and just making a reliable, cheap inverter. These are, we now need to start looking at the hardware as just, this is a platform, and then the applications we can build upon that platform, uh, especially for the inverter, but also for other parts of the system and the system as a whole. Uh, this, you know, these are things that we need to also start thinking about again, instead of just necessarily looking at costs need to come down uh, and you know, I want to find the right reliable supplier. So uh, that's unfortunately all the time that I have, but I do thank you. I think we'll have a rigorous and, and good discussion coming up the rest of this theme. And um, if we can do maybe one question and then we'll move right into the module session right after this. So anyone have a question? Okay, no. And if that's the case, then uh, we'll just move straight into the future of U.S. module supply uh, being moderated by our very own module analyst, Jade Jones.